Sometimes imperfections work brilliantly and sometimes when you're recreating iconic moment, the imperfections just look like you didn't know how to do your job. So you kind of have to lean into making it more perfect than maybe it was in reality. Hi, I'm Catherine Martin and this is how we created and designed the costumes for Elvis. I'm a costume designer and I co-costumed Moulin Rouge with Angus Strathy. Australia, I designed the costumes for. Gatsby, I designed the costumes for. And now I've designed the costumes for Elvis. With Elvis, we created an enormous chart of all of Elvis's jumpsuits that we pasted up on the wall. It was a very long chart. And those kind of things allows you to conceptualize a little bit how you're gonna deal with that part of Elvis's costuming history. Because we only have two and a half hours to tell the story and it takes place from late 40s through till the late 70s, you've got to find a way of compressing a whole lot of story points. You can basically draw from the legacy of Elvis's costumes and sort of synthesize a look out of what he actually wore and imagine what he would have worn in this particular scene. There are moments when you're recreating historical costumes. We had an aha moment when we started working on the black leather costume and appears in the 68 special. If you just imitated it slavishly without taking into consideration what Austin was bringing, you know, he was never going to become Elvis per se. So we needed to find a way of making the historical costumes really work with him. And Baz was always talking about, it's not imitation, it's interpretation. So the fabulous archivists at Graceland measured the suit for us. We knew the width of the calves, we knew how long the jacket was, but through the process of fittings and experimentation, we came to see that we needed to adjust all of these details subtly to make sure they were fitting Austin. His movement and his characterization was supported rather than swamped by the pressure of having to make something exactly like Elvis wore. Things like the collar height. If you look at Elvis, his collar hit him at a certain point and hit an exact angle. And so we needed to get that feeling on Austin, but obviously everybody's neck length is different. So it was really about thinking, okay, Austin is Elvis. This is the suit we wanna put on him. How do we make that feel germane to him? And also there were practical considerations. So we needed different pants for each particular movement style. So when he was throwing himself on the ground, the pants needed to be altered because we needed to fit knee pads under the pants. When he was sitting down, I hate it when you can see people's socks in the top of the boots. So we made the pants longer for sitting down, but hugging pants for when we see him from the back walking down the corridor. We also wanted pristine pants for when he's standing up. Similarly with the jackets, the jacket ended up having all these pieces of elastic that rigged it to the pants. In reality, Elvis's jacket did ride up with wear. You did see the top of his boots, but I suppose we wanted ideal perfection to the moment because that's how people remember it. <laughs> I think we worked on three leather versions in different weights of leather because originally his suit was made out of horse leather and it was a very heavy leather. The first suit we made, Baz was concerned the leather wasn't heavy enough. So we went up a level in thickness and heaviness and then we weren't sure, maybe that was too heavy and was too constrictive in terms of the movement. So then we went somewhere between the two and then we had to make multiples. You always have to take into consideration the practicalities of a costume that's gonna be used over and over and over again. There's a saying in costuming which is one is none. So you're not supposed to only be able to make one of anything. Multiples are incredibly important. 
Along with making reproductions of costumes or outfits that Elvis wore, Baz was also focused on how his costumes reflected his sexuality, his rebelliousness, and created a kind of wildfire amongst his fans. Like, for instance, the lace shirts. Elvis in the mid-50s wore a lot of lace shirts in different colours, and that kind of connected to what we know as kind of rock star today. And also that interesting juxtaposition of the feminine and the masculine. Similarly, Elvis's favourite colour combination was black and pink. So finding a way of incorporating that and to be true to the boxy nature of the 50s look, but at the same time, respect the body underneath. We started experimenting with all of these jackets that were kind of cardigan-like, hung off shoulder pads, very soft. Elvis, very interestingly, always did up the second button. And what it meant was there's more room to move your shoulders. And so through the process of moving and putting the jackets on, we discovered by studying photos how to integrate the jacket and the movement together. It was like an aha moment for Austin and I. We went, hang on a minute, we can't get the shapes to feel what the clothes would be like. Just button the second button and it changed everything. And he could move, the jackets looked different. What are you hollering at? The wiggle. The what? Them girls won't see you wiggle. Elvis was known as Elvis the pelvis. Obviously his pants were important. And it was a lot about the drape, how the fabric worked. In these pants that we coined the squirrel pants, because that's one of the insults that was levelled at Elvis. It's really about the balance of the back and the front, more fullness in the front, how much pleat you have, where the pleats fall at the front, whether you move them more in towards the fly or you bring them more out towards the pocket. Our pants were quite bun-hugging at the back. That's one of the specialities of our tailor, Gloria Bava. She likes a nice bottom. And then it's allowing enough fullness in the front so that you could get all that shake. And then we pegged the legs, as it's called. So they narrowed towards the shoe. There's more air in the top of the leg than there is at the bottom. And basically the pegging allows the top to move, but there's a kind of anchor at the bottom. And it's just a process of experimenting to make sure you're getting exactly the right balance. You have to buy the right fabric. So it was a combination of all those things put together. You spend a lot of time trying to emulate fabrics that existed in the time. One of the interesting things about 50s suiting is there was a lot of texture, a lot more texture than we have today. And that was really hard because you just spend your time looking through tailoring fabric books, just hoping that you're gonna find something that's gonna match or fit what you want. I go online a lot, desperately searching. So we're in the middle of COVID and supply chains were disrupted. There were lots of restrictions and things weren't that available. So going and having natural fabrics digitally printed to replicate the texture or the print on a jacket. This is one of the tricks we use. We get a base cloth that has some kind of texture and then digitally we reproduce the texture and then we print it on the fabric. So photographically, it looks like it matches, but the texture is actually printed on to some extent. If you look at the illustrations, Elvis, who was blonde, and you look at Captain Marvel Jr., who has dark hair and has a big pompadour, you can really see the influence of his hairdo and also the lightning bolt and the cape and these motifs. I think that he aspired all his life to overcome his humble beginnings. He was someone always searching for the rock of eternity. It is incredible that he was able to overcome his background, find his own style and synthesize all these influences and create something that hadn't been done before. It's like a flash of lightning, literally, because you just go like, how did he do that? It still boggles my mind.